Well, all right, to get started today with 1 Samuel, verse 19 through 28. You know, I asked that the Lord would add his blessings to the reading of his word and to the teaching of his word and that the hearers would be edified by it. But when, when was the last time you heard this? My wife has just been diagnosed with cancer. People at my job are conspiring against me behind my back. I'm down on my luck right now, but the Lord is good. You know, just want to challenge the hearers of this message that most of the time when we say the Lord is good is when everything is going okay. But that's not what his goodness is based upon. Your situation, your circumstance. Just think that over. A little food for thought. So verse 19, then they arose early. This is after um, Hannah's countenance was raised after she prayed and wept on the ground. They arose early in the morning and worshiped before the Lord and returned again to their house in Ramah. And Elkanah had relations with his wife Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. And it came about in due time, nine months after Hannah had conceived, that she gave birth to a son, and she named him Samuel, saying, Because I have asked him of the Lord, then the men Alkina went up with all his household to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice and pay his vow. But Hannah did not go up, for she said to her husband, I will not go up until the child is weaned, then I will bring him, that he may appear before the Lord and stay there forever. Verse 23, And Alka, her husband, said to her, Do what seems best to you. Remain until you have weaned him. Only may the Lord confirm his word. So the woman remained and nursed her son until she weaned him. Now when she had weaned him, she took him up with her with a three-year-old bull and one ephah of flour and a jug of wine and brought him to the house of the Lord in Shiloh, although the child was young. And they slaughtered the bull and brought the, joy, brought the boy to Eli. And she said, O oh my Lord, as your soul lives, my Lord, I am the woman who stood here beside you, praying to the Lord. For this boy I prayed, and the Lord has given me my petition, which I asked of him. So I have also dedicated him to the Lord as long as he lives. He is dedicated to the Lord, and he worshipped the Lord there. Now, I'm going to go into the pertinent details of this sermon as we go through it. But in past messages, I've talked to you about context and keeping things in perspective and what is the point of the passage? What is the, what is the authorial intent? Okay, what did, the, what did the author write to the people in that day and age and how do we apply it to today? And it may seem trivial, but here's the deal. How many promises do we make in our lifetime and ask of God, if you do this, or I will do this, if you bless me. Or to other people, in God's name, as Christians. Whenever you make a promise to somebody else, and they know you're a Christian, you are not promising just between you and that person. That person knows, the God, knows that there's a God that you serve. And they have that God held to the highest standard. When you're a Christian and you give your word to anybody... You are giving your word on behalf of God. That's, that's, it's that simple. Okay, so. What's the deal here? Why am I even bringing this up? Because how many times do people give the word and not keep it? Let me make a bold illustration for you. Giving your word and not keeping it is as destructive as what the Nazi Germans did during World War II. Yeah. So, if you want to call them criminals, liars, cheaters, 
haters, deceitful, wicked, and vile, do you know how much you destroy? Do you know how much you destroy when you give your word and don't keep it? Do you know how much you prevent from happening when you give your word and don't keep it? When you give your word, when you tell somebody in the name of the Lord that you're going to do something, you had better get it done. So in other words, when you, before you give your word, you better make sure that you can keep it. And that's all there is to it. I just taught this whole passage. Now we just fill in the details. If you have given your word and not keeping it, you are a criminal. You are a lowlife. You are a person of questionable character. But all you got to do to go back and fix that is to change your ways. And really, you say, oh, well, people give their word and they lose track. It happens all the time. It's never... It's never malicious intended. It's just life. No, 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 no. Because that all happens because of a lack of day school attitude doesn't think that it's important to keep one's word because you, yourself, are the measure of all things. What I want to do. And many times when you're in that state of heart and mind, you give that promise at that moment in time because you have an ulterior motive. Whatever that motive happens to be. We have time to go into that here. But giving your word and not keeping it is one of the most awful things that you can do. It's so destructive you have no idea how awful it is. And I can go on and on and on and on and on about this. But giving your word and not keeping it makes you a deceitful, wicked person. And whether it's a big thing or a small thing. Because, you know, those small things are pretty important too. If I'm at work... And a buddy of mine that I work with is comes in an hour early to help me out because I'm not feeling well. So I call him, he comes in, so he has my back. And I promise him out of gratitude that I'm going to buy him lunch and that I don't do it. That makes me a deceitful, wicked person. Let me give you another example. A couple months ago, a couple of co-workers found out or they, they think that I'm making more money than they are which is really none of their business, okay? They came to me and put an onus on me that I needed to treat them to lunch. Like, they weren't, they weren't asking me to. They were telling me to, ordering me to, the way that they were acting. Very rude, overbearing, brash, you name it. So I had to give them some money to buy them some lunch. And they said, we'll get you back. Oh, they got me back all right. Not only did they manipulatively and sinfully pressure me into buying them lunch when I didn't, I, I didn't offer it because I didn't offer it. I offered to buy things for coworkers all the time. I just hadn't offered to do anything for them. We'll get you back. So guess what they did? They went and, and picked a day when they knew I wasn't going to be at work. Bought the food, brought it in, and because I wasn't there, they ate it turned around, told me, we bought you the food the next day when I was at work, but you weren't there when they knew, when they knew darn well I wasn't going to be there. And no shame, no apology, no nothing. They ate the food, didn't even put it in the refrigerator to take it home and bring it back the next day. Okay? And then to this very day, they continued to insist that they treated me back. What kind of a low life acts that way? People are deceitful and wicked. And I've said this a number of times. I, I, I'm going to focus in on this because this is very important. We live in a time of no moral standards, no ethics. Truth is all relative. No standards and no principles. What I'm saying right now doesn't matter to most people. You know, if it doesn't matter to you, then you're probably not saved. And if you're not saved, then you means you're on your way to hell. You need to listen up and wake up. Okay? Giving your word and keeping it is so important. I cannot emphasize to you how important. I think that if you don't give your word and don't keep it on a consistent basis, then that's evidence that you're not a Christian. Examine your heart to find out if you're really in the faith. That's serious. I consider giving your word and not keeping it. I would put on the same scale as cheating on your taxes, 
uh, shoplifting, um, any other kind of way. If you know something's true, if if you know that you witnessed a crime, but uh, somebody involved with the crime was your friend, so that you're gonna so you're gonna say that you didn't see what you saw, withholding evidence from the police. That's a crime. That's a felony, in fact. Okay, let me tell you this. Here, here's here's a very good example illustration. Keeping your giving your word and not keeping it is a felony with God. It's a felony. It is a felony. And you are a felon. So when you give your word, the next time after you hear this message, you better darn well keep it. Or don't give it. You want to think it over before you make a promise to somebody. To make sure that you can keep that promise. That nothing's going to come in the way of keeping that promise. You know what's sad? Is that the people who made those promises to me about buying me lunch call themselves Christians. I don't think so. I don't think so. So it came about, verse 20, in due time, after Hannah had conceived, she gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, saying, as I gasped him of the Lord. And the man Elkanah went up with all his household to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice and pay as well, because the years passed. But Hannah did not go up. But she said to her husband, I will not go up until the child is weaned, because obviously she's worried about the, the traveling um, affecting the child's health. And then I will bring him that he may appear before the Lord and stay there forever. And Elkanah, her husband, said, verse 23, Do what seems best to you. Remain until you have weaned him. Only may the Lord confirm his word. So the woman remained and nursed her son until she weaned him. Again, just looking out for the health and welfare of her child. Verse 24. Now when she had weaned him, she took him up with her with a three-year-old bull and one ephah of flour, and a jug of wine, and brought him to the Lord, house of the Lord in Shiloh, although the child was young. Okay, so she came and brought what she was supposed to bring, because again, she's keeping her word, and following the rules, the law. And this, this, this tells you that she was concerned about the welfare of the child, because there comes a point in the development of a child where... Um, <clears throat> The child will be ready for travel. So what this means is that she didn't wait two months after she was feeling okay about it. She didn't wait three weeks. As soon as her heart told her the child was ready to travel, it happened. Verse 25, then they slaughtered the bull and brought the boy to Eli. She said, oh, my Lord, as your soul lives, my Lord, I am the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord. For this boy I prayed. And the Lord has given me my petition, which I asked of him. You know what I think she's doing here? It is well known in these circles that Eli was not a great father. Sinner himself. He allowed his sons to follow. His sons followed in his footsteps more than he did. His sons are worse. And here's what's interesting about all this. They know this. Hannah knows that the very priest himself and his boys are corrupt. The, son, the father, not as much as the sons, but the father's corrupt too. He's looked out of the way way too much. He's allowed them to get away with what they got away with. Doesn't matter to her. She doesn't care. She has a relationship with God. God holds us to a higher standard. And that means even when the people who are in a positions of authority are no good, which these three aren't, it doesn't matter. She doesn't compare whether she obeys God or not with what other people are doing. She knows what she's supposed to do. She knows what God expects of her, and she does it. Since when do we allow people who call themselves Christians, who are rotten people, rotten to the core, and say, okay, well, these people are no good, so I'm not going to believe in Jesus either. Oh, really? You want to wager your eternal destiny because of your self-righteous judgment against another person who you barely know? Really? Biggest, most foolish mistake you can make in this life is to say that there is no God and that the God, God that is, is not the God of Israel. You call yourself enlightened? That's the most foolish thing you could possibly say. To wager your eternal destiny, hell, on it. I can think of nothing more important in the life of anybody to have a right. And look at the people who are far more concerned with everything else than that. It's craziness. So anyway, she is sitting here saying, I obeyed him. 
And her heart, that's, that's not what the pastor said, but she's, I, she has obeyed him regardless of whether or not these examples are living right, setting a good example. What she's saying in this passage is, oh my Lord, as your soul lives, look here, look at what the Lord has done. They know that. The, they, they don't know for certain whether the, uh, the priests know Jesus, know God. They're not living for him. Quite the opposite. So she, she pays him a token of respect. Oh my Lord, as your soul lives, very respectful. I am the woman who stood here before beside you praying to the Lord. For this boy I prayed, and the Lord has given me my petition, which I asked of him. You ever thought for a second that she's trying to evangelize this guy? That she's trying to witness to him? If you're not sure if the person says, she's not saying that he isn't. She's just not sure. And his sons could very well be within hearing distance of this. Anytime a believer in Christ like this, Hannah, who sincerely loves the Lord, which you can tell from the passage, has an opportunity to witness to someone that they're not sure whether they know Christ or not, you do it. And you do it respectfully. She's not saying, well, priest, I, look at what I did. Or, or see, see what God did, priest? See, doubter, hypocrite, you know? With that kind of condescending tone of voice, not those words, but that tone of voice. She didn't do it now here. She is lovingly respecting this priest, even though she probably doesn't think too much of him. She's trying to witness to him. So I have also dedicated him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is dedicated to the Lord, and he worshiped the Lord there. And then she says so she goes further in 28 that the petition, that, and then she explains the petition. He's dedicated to the Lord, Nazar and Nazarene. And he worshipped her there. The little boy worshipped the Lord there. See what I'm saying? So, this concludes verse 28, this sermon. And I pray that it would edify you to no end. I pray that the message is challenging and bold and in your face. Testing you. Challenging you. Convicting you. And remember this. I preach politically incorrectly. And this is the way all preaching should be. Check out, if you think I'm too brash and bold, check out Jonathan Edwards sometime. Okay? Check out John Piper sometime. People who say, oh, I'm too brash. I'll go over the top. I, this, look, listen to John Piper, a very successful author. He, he, he goes further than I do. Way further than I do. I'm soft compared to John Piper. So, that concludes this message. And I pray that uh, you would be challenged by it and nothing more than that. And you have a great day.